Hello beautiful community, you're very welcome to this video in which we're going to just spend 30 seconds grounding ourselves about where we are in the war and then I've jotted down the points I want to discuss today. One is who benefits um, from the Belgorod invasion. Two is just an important point to understand about Russia's extraordinary um, borderlessness. And then I think we'll move to looking a bit at not the issues but at the issues around dealing with the issues and we'll look a bit at what it means to uh, discuss the war in a healthy and constructive way um, and I want to make with you three points about that particularly for those who were with us for the first video um, from yesterday on the second chat channel welcome here if you are new this is where we have casual conversations. There is also a main channel. So let's go. I don't feel amazing, um, I must say, at the moment, because about the war. Um, because I do think that Ukraine could have been put in a stronger position than the position it's in at the moment. Um, the position it's in at the moment is that breaking the Russian land bridge to Crimea would be a sensational overachievement and may even need to depend on some kind of largely self-inflicted catastrophic collapse in the Russian military, which can't be ruled out um, because of the extraordinary divisiveness and lack of organization and um, absence of morale or even any chance of adequate morale in the Russian military. And then the second point that's concerning is that we aren't clear about what happens after the counteroffensive and how far the West can back Ukraine after that. And we know that what we're dealing with here, if we've been part of this ongoing conversation for a long time, is an extraordinary kind of imperial implosion Right? It's an empire that's self-immolating and as it were its last act is to engage in a quite existential pattern of escalation against the West, a pattern that needs to be stopped by force for it itself won't stop and Mr. Putin himself won't stop and can't stop and that 15 months into the war is um, still something folks don't get, especially once you get outside of Eastern Europe. So my first issue is who benefits at the moment from the Belgrade situation as we know it. I would still say Ukraine. I think that the operation may have had some... Um, tangible, non-image, non-propaganda driven benefits, um, distracting the Russians, forcing the Russians to relocate resources potentially. But in the end, we should see it as a kind of psychological and image driven operation. Now, there were two groups that claimed responsibility. And yesterday I said that um, there was very little evidence that one of the groups effectively exists. Um, and that's the Russian uh, Liberty Legion or whatever they're called. Um, the other group we do know exists, and that's the Russian Volunteer Corps. Um, since yesterday, expert opinion seems to have converged a bit more with even more confidence on the um, uh, probable non-existence of the Russian liberty, liberty of Russia um, legion. Um, but we can st st still keep our minds open and s see what happens. But what we, we can confidently say is that this is certainly not in any interesting way an independent Russian partisan group, but a Ukrainian operation. Um, now, a global PR downside is that the folks we have seen involved in that operation 
who are part of the um, Russian Volunteer Corps um, are unsavory characters. And at least three of them that I've spotted and I've observed analyses of are recognizable to me and didn't look particularly unlovely. If you want to know more, uh, you can follow Elliot Higgins from Bellingcat on Twitter. He's been, he's been um, uh, refreshing us about who these people are. And, and of course, they are uh, folks with very well-established neo-Nazi histories. And um, one of them, Elliot claims, that it, so it looks like it to me, had a badge with the three letters and the white hood. Now, surely that looks catastrophic for Ukraine. No, it doesn't. It doesn't look good. And it, it, it doesn't help in the West, these divides between those who want to support Ukraine and those who are skeptical. Um, but in the end, I suppose Ukraine's answer is, look, the best Russian proxies we have under control are these guys, and these are the guys we're going to use. Um, but why, you know, having said this, do I think that this is still a kind of win for Ukraine? Because the central image coming out of it is of Russia as a fake entity. And I don't necessarily mean fake that it uh, needs to be split up into lots of different countries. That's a separate conversation entirely. By fake entity, I mean that what we take to be true about Russia is often true at the level of the informational environment rather than in reality. And so th this descendant of the Soviet Union can't defend its territory from four and a half geezers with a couple of vehicles who are just riding around and 24 hours later they were still riding around. Um, I do think that almost at a kind of a subconscious level hits at actually one of the myths that blocks support for Ukraine which is the myth of uh, an invincible and powerful Russia which can't lose. Point one done. Point two. Um, borderlessness. Actually, before borderlessness, let me make a, a, a brief point about when could we expect, right, um, outside of the fairy tales of Mr. Ilya Panamarev, when could we really expect genuine partisan activity in Russia and genuine sort of uh, uh, or sort of organic domestic conflict w with expression and significant violence. Um, I think for things like that to arise, there needs to be a crack in the regime. Um, and that feels somewhere between likely and inevitable. Um, and take many different forms, but one of the standard forms historically this takes in declining tyrannies is two contradictory commands, for example, that somebody needs to fulfill, right? and then they react and on the situation goes. Borderlessness. Um, now, the other thing that this reveals, this operation, um, psychological PR operation, um, by Ukraine is that um, what we all knew is demonstrated again, and that is that Russia just doesn't care about these border towns. Am I speaking too quietly? Russia just doesn't care about these border towns. And I recall saying something deliberately provocative, but actually truthful, disturbingly truthful, actually, uh, in some of my early videos during the beginning of the war. And that is that Putin could have declared that he wasn't attacking Ukraine, but he was in fact attacking a part of Russia. And conceivably, he could have said, we're bombing not Kharkiv, but Belgorod. And a large part of the Russian population would have accepted that too. And that's a sign of the fact that it's not just that Russia's um, takeover of Ukrainian territory is kind of bogus, that not it's not really possible for them outside of a 
the outside of the Z radicals and not even mo not, il not even all of them too. It's not really possible for them to say, well, this territory is ours and believe what they're thinking. But that there's a kind of a deeper borderlessness where even when it comes to Russian territory, Russia, like really Russian territory, internationally recognized Russian territory, right? Something 100 kilometers inside Russia's border. Um, there's still a kind of a sense of borderlessness whereby um, the country's self-image of itself doesn't clarify where the country ends and the country begins. And so Putin could have chopped off a bit of Russia and given it to Ukraine, and much of the population would have felt, okay, well, our borders are swimming about, they'll continue to swim about. And that, in effect, is a certain kind of interesting um, uh, sy symptom of imperial decline. Now, three points about not this incident, but how we talk about it and therefore how we negotiate the informational environment and how we make sense of the world, hopefully and truthfully. My health is about 20% you know, better in this video, so I can actually, I can't see you, but I can see the lens of my phone. So I'm actually looking at you and I want to be really serious, really serious about what I'm about to say. Because on, on the bad days, my videos work like this. Uh, I'm say, I say to myself, Vlad, first of all, make sure you're sitting up. Secondly, make sure you're speaking words. Thirdly, make sure the words make sense. And fourthly, make sure they bring value to the community in that order. So <laughs> now it's a bit better. So we, we're connecting more. Um, so I deliberately said two things in the last video um, that were going to push a minority of you. And they did. Um, and a minority of the beautiful community um, didn't like the two points I made. And before I get to that, because there's something really fascinating we can learn in looking at this, um, I want to say something of unbelievable importance about how we can be misguided about... Um, the weather online, as it were. And by the weather, I mean um, where the wind is blowing, how much the wind is blowing, which is really to say how many people are thinking something, how strongly do they think it, how many of them are there. And so there was a feeling that th there was a, a, a minor backlash against my last video. And I want to I want to analyze that because it'll teach us something about institutions, something that's nothing to do with my YouTube channel and you know something much bigger. Um, but what in fact happened is that the most critical comment and the last the last video I pinned, so it actually became popular partly because I um, made it front and center, and we'll come to quite what that point was. Here's the deal. If you look at the comments, it might look like, I don't know, 10% of the people were uncomfortable with some of the things that I, I, I said in the video. But that ain't true. So what is going on? Well, I'll tell you what is going on. And I've never actually experienced it myself, but I know institutions experience it. Um, I made a, a, a modest contribution to a Scandinavian documentary recently. And after they did a write-up of a partial write-up of some of my views. Actually, I thought there was an important point missing there, but it doesn't matter, um, on on their website. And I, I looked at how it was distributed on social media and the comments underneath were, like pages upon pages of comments were, and, and I was warning there about Russian disinformation and the comments were anti-institutional. Right, the sort of comments was a Danish public broadcaster. So the comments would have been the sort of comments that the BBC might get in the UK. Who is this supposed guy from Russia? He is a CIA asset. He is a slimy uh, globalist, evil, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And if you're not careful, you could get the impression that that's actually, that's actually most people, I think, are reacting like that. And of course they're not. Um, 
But this is hugely important because so often what happens to institutions like the BBC, but there are other major institutions, especially institutions that are trying to speak to the whole country. There's not enough of them at, like that still at the moment, but there, there we go. We just, we need them. Um, but they release something and they see a terrible backlash online and they're thinking, oh my word, we need to now go back on the defensive. And what often happens is that actually 12% of the population feel something that strongly, that clearly. But it feels like it's not 12, but 70 or 80, if you judge it by the reaction. But in fact, it's not, right? And so back to yesterday's video, um, I made a comment about um, what we would make of that group that went into Russian territory if they weren't Ukraine sponsored, if they were just completely you know, indigenous. And then I said something about how uh, Ukraine's um, information war has actually helped a lot of people in the West support Ukraine. And some people didn't like these two comments. And in the comments, you can see just a very minor minority, right? But actually, but, but actually even that can look much more than it really is because I went in which I don't do often enough, to be honest, I'm a terrible YouTuber into the analytics. And when the video was at about a, whatever, in the late 90s, um, around 100,000 views, I looked at the number of dislikes and there were 80 dislikes per 100,000 views and thousands, several thousand likes. So fascinating distortive effect and that effect is of enormous importance when it comes to understanding at least part of the cause of why so many institutions are on the defense and they are terrified and they're always playing a defensive game. That's the point for now. Now to the two specific points I made. So I said that um, if this wasn't a Ukraine-sponsored activity, but if similar characters basically manifested the same action deep in Russian territory with no connection to Ukraine, um, we could call them a uh, terror group. And a lot of you said, well, no, no, why would you say that? I mean, for that, they would have to be directly targeting civilians and yeah, maybe they they, they maybe they had a conflict, they killed somebody, they killed some border guard or whatever, but they weren't targeting civilians and so on. So the reason I said that in the first place is that I knew some people would be uncomfortable with it. And it was very important to challenge that because what we are about in this community is challenging ourselves around risks to us having blockages around self-extraction, right? being able to get out of ourselves, right? And in a way that might be inconvenient to our narrative to see the experience of others. My passion, and I have to put my cards down, is not that you get everything right about Ukraine or Russia and so on, is about your democracies. I don't want you to have a crisis of self-extraction around understanding others in your democracy who are in opposition right, to you and who worryingly now might even think of you as their political enemy. Right? And what I want us to keep coming back to is this project of Western citizens developing their skills to the maximum of engaging in conflict constructively so that their democracies, while being in bumpy waters, do not sink. So what about the Russian? And, and that is actually the motivation for me saying, oh, we'd call them a terror group. So um, let's let just visualize this. Um, imagine the Putin regime is as it is and you are in a town bang in the middle of Russia. And let us say a dozen folks with specially, with, let's say several of them with specially unlovely um, political histories associated um, with all kinds of you know, extreme hard right supremacist um, uh, connections, actions, and so on, that these folks 
drive a couple of military vehicles around villages, maybe attack an official, don't attack civilians. And of course, they say that they're against the Putin regime. But I mean, they are against the Putin regime, but what, what, what exactly it is they're trying to achieve isn't clear. And it looks like a bit of a PR act. And then these people have these strange backgrounds, and that's what they're doing. Um, how would you feel about that as a citizen? Right? I mean, there are these three bits of the Russian population. There's people who are that sympathetic. There's a depoliticized blob in the middle. And there are the anti-war folks and anti-Putin folks who are really rather broken and silenced at the moment. At the moment. Um, well, you're going to feel enormously, enormously intimidated. Physically intimidated. Just because you live in a tyranny, uh, it doesn't mean that you aren't going to be threatened by another tyrannical action, which is tanks driving around your city, right? Now, here a very interesting point comes in, which I also shared on, on some venues, and that is that I personally come from a tradition of thinking about politics, whereby making political distinctions, like is this a terror group, is this not, is itself not just an analytical, but a political act. And so whether we would call in this case of them doing this in the middle of Russia, them a terror group or a liberation group or something in the middle would depend in part on the constructiveness of their action and on their motivations and on maybe some background project that drives what they're doing. And depending on our analysis of that, we would arrive at the label. We would not just arrive at the label via the application of some kind of abstract definition, which is anyway contested, right? There's plenty of definitions of terrorism that would include just threat of force or you know, great physical intimidation, which how would you feel, right? If you are, let's say, a depoliticized Russian and you see that Putin is doing some kind of a min, min, meat mincer, but you're in denial about it and you're avoiding it, right? How would you feel if that stuff was driving around your town? And it had nothing to do with Ukraine, because if it's Ukraine, it's not terrorism. It's actually you know, um, a legitimate action, part of an existential war for survival against a brutal invasion backed by genocidal rhetoric. But if we're abstracting Ukraine completely out of it and it's local, right, um, it, it would not be implausible to immediately at least be open to that categorization. Blah, blah, blah. Enough. Next point. And last point. So I said something extraordinarily innocent, but I, I said it in a, in a way that would deliberately sort of oh, ah, make some people feel uncomfortable. And some of you, um, in, in a very earnest way, got in touch with me and felt troubled by it. And I actually had a you know, very um, warm interaction, um, a couple of warm interactions about this. What I said, I don't remember it exactly, but is, is that if you're reading this and I said this in a Twitter thread, but that was also part of my video. If you're reading this, for some of you it'll be the case, or it may be the case, right, that your support for Ukraine is partly a product of Ukraine's great information politics. And um, Zelensky is extraordinarily moving capacity to speak for his people. Right? So we're coming back to it. Because it is a very unhealthy reaction to be troubled by it. Right? And why were people troubled by it? Well, because, no, I support Ukraine, not because Zelensky has done certain things well. I support Ukraine because it's the right cause. Now, obviously, the answer is both. You know, the European, North American, you know, Western outrage at what the Russians are doing in Ukraine is organic. But of course it is enormously mediated by Ukraine's brilliant informational politics. It's mediated by Zelensky's capacities as a communicator. It's mediated by Zelensky staying in Kiev and not running away. It's mediated by how extraordinarily quickly, well, not so quickly in some people's view, but I actually think quickly within a matter of weeks, Zelensky managed to really grow into his new stature. Right? 
So it's both. And there are ugly things going on in the world that we know disproportionately little about because compelling stories haven't been told. So the idea that it is an affront to be told, that you're partly awake to this because the compelling stories told about it, is a crisis. What kind of crisis is it? It's a crisis of an incapacity to keep in mind two things and not just one. It's organic and Ukraine's informational warfare is outstanding. Both. And it's part of the cause of the support Ukraine sustained so far. And so this is not about Ukraine in the end. This is about our capacity at home to consolidate with our political allies and to engage in conflict with our political opponents without treating them like enemies. And to be awake to political reality as opposed to be claustrophobically arguing about minor differences, often minor identity differences. When not just big picture stories about which kind of progress we urgently need to make are at stake, but also big stories about our risks of losing much of what we have are at stake. Lots of love. Talk soon.